Hello, congregation. Welcome once again to another bone stepping edition of The Bone. Now grab your Bible, open application upon your phone, open up a web browser, however you follow along in Holy Scripture, because we here at The Bone are believing sola scriptor. Now you may be saying, Kevin, that sounds like Latin. In Latin, you would be correct, as Latin means the scriptures and the scriptures alone. We don't believe the Watchtower, the Book of Mormon, someone's personal revelation, someone's opinion, or even culture trumps Holy Scripture, that the Christian is under authority of God's Holy Word because it's good for teaching, reproof, and training in righteousness. So grab your Bible, open up to the series, open up to 1 John. In our series of 1 John, you know we're knee-deep in good theology. So open up to 1 John, John chapter 2. We're getting ready to dive into the middle of this, this chapter. John is getting ready to change gears. If you got a, if you must must remember this is before Twitter. This is before Facebook and before uh, network television TV. It, it's before uh, MySpace or it's before texting and cell phones and it's before ham radio. It, it, it's before Morse code. They actually wrote down letters and passed them around and now he's passed around this letter to Asia Minor. The church is there and now the congregation is reading the, the uh, beloved apostle is writing to them and telling them how to live like a practical theology. How to live their life in everyday life, not using big words that make no sense to them. Now John is writing to them, capturing their heart, capturing their affections for Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to do here at the Boneyard here right now, keeping it in context. Because if we take it out of context, it's pretext. Taking something out of uh, uh, and spinning it and making our own tapestry of theology, making a quilt work and wrapping ourselves, having a false sense of security. We want to make sure that the scripture says what it says in context. So let us begin. If you remember our last episode, we talked about being an authentic Christian, being someone who shows that they're a Christian, shows that the proof by the fruit of their life. This is what John is talking about here. And we're going to see a third attribute that a Christian has as we continue along in our study of 1 John. So open your Bible. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to pick up at verse 4 and we're going to go quickly through this chapter and study it, dissect it verse by verse and see what the, the apostle means when he says these words. Picking up in 1 John chapter 2 verse 4. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Wow, already John is hitting hard. He's saying that if you say you love Jesus and you don't keep his commandments, then you're not really in love with Jesus. Jesus tells us in John, again, John's wrote in John chapter 14, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's why you won't see an authentic Christian living in a homosexual lifestyle. You won't see an authentic Christian getting sloppy drunk every single day. You won't see an authentic Christian popping pills to get high. You won't see an authentic Christian lying habitually. You won't see an authentic Christian not worshiping idols, other things other than God. You won't see an authentic Christian dishonoring his parents. You you won't see an authentic Christian breaking God's laws and commands and statutes. God calls his people to be holy. Now, are you saying, Kevin, that uh, I have to be perfect and good? No, no, no. If you remember in our other episodes, advocate or opponent, that when we sin as Christians, we have an advocate, someone who steps in, who, who's interceding on our behalf, encouraging us. God calls his Christians, his disciples to be perfect, and then he gives them power the, and the ability to be perfect with the Holy Spirit. But we said, he says that whoever, whoever says, I, I love him and I know him, but does not keep his commandments and a liar, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Look at verse five, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. The, 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 the love the love that John is talking about is the perfection of the law. See, the Christian is in love with Jesus. He, he remembers and has gratitude for what Christ has done. And he has faith in the future grace that Jesus will provide for him. Yes, yes, yes. He, he will stumble and he will, he will fall. And as we keep reading, we'll see how John talks about those who are weak in the faith, those who are strong in the faith, and those who are mature in the faith, and how we're all part of the body of Christ. But we see that we are perfected by our love for Christ. 
For someone who's in love with Jesus, they will hold his words at a higher calling and a higher standard than what culture and society says. He, he'll fall in love and be enamored and fall in love with more than the, the fall in love with the scriptures more than what the entertainment, the entertainment industry has. He'll fall in love with Jesus more than pornography. He'll fall in love with Jesus more than his own life. He'll fall in love with Jesus more than any idol that his heart can conjure up or this world may offer his affection his love is for the law because God requires us to keep his standards and we fall short but God gives us an affection for the law because we are in love with him and we want to keep his commandments we want to please him that is the perfection of the law that John is talking about look at verse 6 whoever says he abides in him ought to know in the same way in which we ought to walk in the same way in which he walked we are to see the way Jesus walked. Do what Jesus did and does. Go where Jesus went. Say what Jesus said. We, whoever says he abides in him, staying in him. See, if we look back in the, the chapter, we see that John is speaking about knowing the law, knowing God, knowing the truth, knowing Christ and doing it. See, the word knowing is found almost 40 times in this epistle. But the word do it, doing, and, and going about, putting action is found at least 10 times. Knowing and doing, it's almost like uh, two pedals on a bicycle. Knowing and doing, knowing and doing. Having knowledge of the law, knowing about Jesus, knowing about your Bible, knowing all the little Bible stories in the Old Testament will not do you any good just knowing them, head knowledge, unless you do it. Like my pastor says, any scriptures that you know and do is scriptures that you believe. Do you believe what the scripture says? And do you do what the scripture says? Do you just know it? Do you have facts that you can ramble off about the tabernacle in the Old Testament? Do you know about how long Noah or Abraham or even Moses' beard is? Or do you know about the facts of the 12 tribes of Israel? But you don't do what the Bible says. Do you don't do what he commands and you don't live by the statutes that God requires his people? Then you don't know him and you're a liar. We see, we see here that John is talking about whoever says, whoever says he abides in him. We are to abide in Christ, be in him, be one in the same. Let, let us be so consumed with God that when people see us, they don't know where we end and he begins. Let us abide in him. Let's use this little analogy. In the holidays, whenever you have family or uh, friends or cousins and uncles, they enter a room at the holidays and you're there at the family reunion and you really can't get along with that person. You can't abide in the same room with them. Their, their personality, their, their, their attitudes totally conflict with you. For the Christian, if we abide in Christ, his spirit is like our spirit because we are like him, we're changed into his image, then we'll simply fit together. We see here that John, it says, whoever, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Do you walk the same way Christ walks? Do you speak the same way Christ speaks? Now, many of us have a, a, a screwed up idea of the way Christ speaks. And at one point, John, John, he, had, he, was, a, he was a disciple, but he had an um, a, a angry attitude. He, he spoke with fire and he, he spoke with conviction, but not much love. And we can see here the maturity of John as he's grown, as he's abide, abided in Christ. As we can see in this epistle, how he's changed. Not the Christian uh, when he's at the altar and he, he, he repents of his sins and trusts in Christ. He's not instantly perfect and all his personality flaws are gone. No, no, no. He, he matures and grows and John addresses that as we keep reading. Look at verse 7. Beloved. John is speaking with love as maybe a, a father to his child with endearment. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment, that is, the old commandment is the word that you have heard. We see in these verses here that John doesn't explicitly say what this commandment is, but we know it's love. Because further along in chapter 3, verse 11, John, 
John tells us that love is, for we know, for this is the message that we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. John is saying that we've heard this message in verse 7 of chapter 2. We've heard this message, and it's no new commandment, but an old commandment that we've heard from the beginning. What beginning? Well, we can see from the beginning of time where Jesus was speaking with God, and God speaking with Jesus, let us make man. God makes man out of the dust of the earth and the clay and molds him out of love. He brings him, the animals, out of love so he can name them. He brings him Eve out of love that he can be uh, not alone. Then he redeems man. He makes a promise in him in in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that, that he will redeem man and not leave him in the state that he's in as a fallen person, never to reach God's presence again out of love. We can see here that John is saying that, but the old commandment that you heard from the the beginning, the old commandment is the word that you have heard. Saying that Jesus spoke. He spoke about love. Jesus was compelled from love. Why would anyone come from heaven to save liars, fornicators, murderers, homosexuals, angry people, bitterness, unforgiving, who are idol worship, pagan, haters of God, religious, who uses their theology and doctrines as machetes to cut people down. What would compel a God to do that? See, religion put shackles on people. It says, do this, do that, go there, give, do this, give until you die, die for a cause. But Christianity, Christ, Christ does all those things for people like me. People who deserve hell in spite of me. Dirty people who are stained to their soul. People who could never earn their way to heaven. Instead of saying, do this and do that, go there, give this. Christ says, I've done that. I went there. I did this. I did this for people like you and me. Congregation, that's the difference between religion and Jesus. That's the difference. Religion is man trying to earn his way to heaven. And he's trying to get to heaven. And it's not that he even loves heaven. He just doesn't want to go to hell. That's the difference. Jesus, Jesus is reaching down, reaching to us, snatching us from hell. And it's not because he's lonely. It's not because he's compelled to do it because he's a nice guy. He does it out of love. We see here that from the beginning, the old, the old commandment, we can see in Deuteronomy that God even commanded the children of Israel to love and now as Christians who are new creatures with new features, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that we're new creatures with new features. The old has passed away. Behold, all is made new. We see here that we are new and are, are compelled with love. We're to love like Jesus loved. We're to give like Jesus gives. And we're not to look down upon each other to turn our noses up at someone who has track marks up his arms or who has a blue mohawk or who's dirty, who smells like urine or who's addicted or someone who's dry and religious, that we're not to judge them, that we're to pray for them because it very well could have been us. That we are compelled by love because Christ was compelled to save us. How great a sinner that we are. He's a much greater Savior. Look at verse 8, at this time is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. John is saying here that the passing away that we're reading about is our, uh, the Judaism, that the Old Testament is passing away. Even Paul wrote about it as we look through a glass dimly. It's looking through a a tinted windshield that we can barely make out the image of Christ. And now through the New Testament, we see that the promise of Jesus has came to redeem people like me, the rebellious and the religious. Jesus saves sinners. The passing away is the the, the perverted humanism where we think uh, 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 human rights and we have uh, a moral compass that slides wherever we think and our hearts desire. That we have no standard. It's humanism and also, also paganism. Worshipping other things and other gods. All those things are now passing away. That Those things will not sustain us and the one thing that will sustain us is the love of Christ. What would compel a Christian when this world is afflicting him, beating him, sending him through trials and tribulations? What will sustain him to get up and keep carrying on the good fight? The love of Christ. 
The love is not found in us. It's given by Jesus. Jesus loved us. Jesus compels us. Jesus powers us. Jesus powers us to keep us fighting the good fight of faith. Jesus loves sinners like me. We see here that John is talking about the darkness that's passing away and the true light is already shining. The, the darkened mind of the reader is now illuminating with the gospel. Whenever we rightly understand the gospel, it changes our worldview. It changes our idea of human trafficking, abortion. It changes our political affiliations. It changes everything about the person. No other thing in the world does that. Other books inform and give us knowledge of the Bible. The Bible illuminates Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it, it awakens darkened, dead hearts, stony hearts. It changes us. The gospel changes everything about a man that we see here. The light, the true light is already shining. Verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. If you are harboring some kind of unforgiveness, or you have some kind of hate between you and a, another person or a, a, a person of a stereotype. Uh, uh, or maybe you're a Westboro Baptist Christian. You, God hates homosexuals and you're picketing soldiers and homosexual funerals. and You hate those people and you're more well known by for what you hate than for who you love. We see here that John, John says you are in the dark and the truth is not in you. Maybe you are a Westboro Baptist and you're, you're against wine bibbers and you're against drunks and you're against drugs and, you're, and you hate, uh, and you, maybe you're on the other end and you hate doctrine and you hate theology and you hate tr training and teaching and you hate those things. And maybe you hate speaking in tongues and you, maybe you hate dry, dry, crispy, dead religion. And you're more known for what you hate than for who you love. Maybe you hate contemporary music. Maybe you think every church should have a banjo and an organ. Maybe you think we should hum our hymnals. Maybe you think hymnals are so archaic and out of date and you hate those things. You sound a lot like John. You say, Kevin, wait, the apostle John? Yeah, yeah. See, I can relate to John. John was young. He was full of vigor and zeal and power and he spoke with authority. And if we read back in Luke chapter 9, he was standing with his brother James. You know James, his brother. They called him the sons of thunder. So he was probably a loud kind of guy. And he wasn't uh, um, timid. You know where John stood on things in his opinion. See, John, I can relate to John. I, I'm a lot like John. John grew to be an old man and mature in Christ. But see, I'm still young and I'm still learning. John, in Luke chapter 9, verse 54. He's standing with Jesus, and there's the Samaritans, and, they're, and they're, they're just wild. They're living however they want. They're sleeping around, getting high, getting drunk, worshiping other gods, and they, they don't want Jesus. Jesus, you got to get out of here. You're a buzzkill. You're, you're raining on our parade. You're killing our party. Uh, you got to go. The cameras are here. The paparazzi, you're just messing up our image. And what does John do? He turns and looks at James, and James is seething. Don't these people understand who's standing here? This is Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's the bread of heaven. He's here on a rescue mission for sinners. And here they are outright rebelling against him, rejecting him, hating him. And what does John do? He looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, let me call down fire from heaven. Let me let them consume them. Let me destroy them. Let me wipe them out. Come on, Jesus. Let me kill them. They got to go away. He had a Westboro Baptist kind of personality, a, a, a thought, a, 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 an ideology. But how does Jesus respond? How does Jesus look at John? What does he say to John? John, you don't understand what kind of spirit you have. Slow your roll, pump your brakes. Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody. We know that in John chapter 3, verse 16, 17, 18. We're already condemned. Jesus could have came and walked among us and folded his arms and said, Oh, look, oh, look at them. They're sleeping. Oh, they're sleeping around. Oh, they're, they're nasty. They're idol worshippers. They're pagan. They're wicked. Oh, I should call fire down from heaven and destroy them all. Truth be known. If 
Jesus was to be fair. He could have came and wiped us all out and sent us all to hell. He could have come and killed us all and destroyed us all because we, we truly deserve it. John deserved it. Those Samaritans deserved it. But we see here he came to reconcile. He came to forgive. He came to wash the stains from our dirty souls. He came to appease the holiness of God who's required to judge sinners like you and me. So John here says, if he hates his brother, if you, if you hate your brother and abide in the darkness, the truth is not in you. John wanted to call fire down from heaven and now John has matured. He's grown. He's, he's understanding. He's realizing. Oh, young minister, youth pastor, pastor, preacher, evangelist, don't be known for what you hate and stand against. Be known who you stand for. Falling in love with Christ, beckoning people to come to Jesus, tackling them if you have to at the, the gates of hell, telling them that Jesus died for dirty people, stinky people, wrecked people, people with track marks, marks up their horns, people who sell their body for money, people who deserve hell. Jesus died for the religious people. People who, who worship hymnals, people who worship order and service, people who worship doctrine and theology, who have a knowledge of Christ but don't truly know him. Jesus died for sinners and that is love. Who would die? Who would die for a good man as we read in Romans? Who would die for an outstanding citizen? It's rare, but who would die for someone, someone like me? Someone dirty, someone who deserves hell as you're watching, you are being convicted in your spirit and you know you're, you're not on good terms with God and you know you're a rebel, you know you're religious and you deserve hell. You, you've put in doctrine and standards and you, you've been known for hating other people because they're homosexual, they're black or they're white or Puerto Rican or Mexican, they're illegal aliens, they're Republican or Democrats. You hate them, you hate those people you're more known for what you hate than for what you love. Let this be practical theology. Let this surge deep into your heart. Repent. Fall in love with Christ so you can fall in love with your enemies. Fall in love with Christ so you can fall in love with the Samaritans. Don't call them fire. Call them mercy. As we see John as mature. And if you've been watching the bone yard over the years and you've seen me mature, oh, I've made mistakes and I've said some crazy things. But it's by grace. He forgives. Oh, he's merciful. As you're watching, you're saying, Kevin, I, I can't come to Jesus. I, I'm too dirty. I, I've got a, a reputation. I, I, people know about me. They know I, I pop pills. I drink. I get high. I, I sleep around. I've not had time for Jesus and this God thing. I put him on the back burner. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. My, play, my favorite places in the whole world are at the foot of the cross and on the stool of repentance. Repent. Throw down those sins. You're saying, Kevin, what does all that mean? It's like having your arms full from coming home from a day of work and you have dry cleaning in your arms, your briefcase, groceries in your arms, your car keys and your arms are filled. As you walk through the door, maybe you see a long-lost loved one there you haven't seen in years. How would you react? You say, give me a second, let me lay these groceries down, these eggs. Let me put my laundry over here. Let me put my keys away. Hold on, let me turn off my cell phone. Or would you toss those things down and embrace your loved one? That's what I'm beckoning you to do today. Throw those sins down. Throw those arms full of idols. There's homosexuality, there's homophobia. Throw those things down. Throw that hate and unforgiveness and bitterness. Throw it down and embrace Christ. He is the only way.